feel that dogs are capable of moral judgments? Can they knowingly transgress humans? Do they have premeditated thought? Um, I think um, moral is, uh, you know, a very human thing. You know, I said there were certain areas where uh, we we don't overlap with dogs, and uh, you know, morals are uh, sort of uniquely human. I think they're sort of a cultural thing. I mean, they kind of vary from place to place as to what is right and what is rote, and it's all to do with customs and cultures. I mean, what is morally acceptable so in one place for a human isn't in another, and. You know, dogs have not, um, you know, developed that so obviously, but, you know, dogs do have uh, rules. Dogs are basically victimized here, uh, pit bulls in particular. Um, breed ban legislation, there's absolutely no evidence to date that breed ban legislation, which has been tried in a number of jurisdictions, has any effect whatsoever in diminishing either uh, serious dog attacks, fatal dog attacks, or dog bites in general. So, so far, they, they're a big goose egg. It hasn't worked. The other thing is, of course, that they're unenforceable. Um, how, if you think about sort of applying resources to try and enforce a breed ban, because resources are not infinite, you're automatically pulling resources from other things that may actually be beneficial to the public health. And so I think we all have a stake in knowing how our tax money is spent to protect public health, protect children, etc. And I'm not sure I want my money um, thrown at breed ban legislation, which has been really so far not proven to be very effective, when there are other problems facing society. You have to take each dog as an individual and just look at it. Each dog, really of any breed, needs to be judged as an individual, needs to be treated as an individual, and uh, the thought that all game-bred pit bulls, uh, when they're uh, rescued by a humane group, uh, need to be destroyed because they're somehow a threat to the community is, is just a really bad uh, idea. through history there's always one type or breed of dog that's going to be the fall guy um, you know shepherds got it for a while and, and dobermans and, and now everybody seems to be focusing on pit bulls and um, once it starts it, it becomes a media thing you know it has nothing to do with reality or or what's actually happening it now becomes a, a media thing and it, it's a frenzy and it's a fireball and it, it keeps growing and growing and growing if a pit bull now just looks mean at someone, is going to be in the paper. So you get a, a very unrepresentative attention, which is paid to one breed or type of dog. And they're just in the media all the time. It's very, very difficult to combat the media frenzy because it, it's simply not based on fact. Um, I think we still have to keep um, just grinding away and, and laying out the facts to people. But to me, it's, it's not just a, a, a pit bull issue. It's, it's the way that we would treat all dogs. We have to, I think, be much more proactive as dog professionals, as trainers and, and veterinarians, in explaining to people that um, a dog does not come fully trained and friendly. And, and this, of course, is the myth which is, has been sort of put forward largely by you know, kennel clubs and people in the dog fancy who have an extreme genetic bias uh, on behavior. We have to let people know, no, you make the dog. And, you know, to all intents and purposes, the, the biggest variable in, in a dog's demeanor is uh, how well was it socialized and how well was it trained. So I think we need to be very, very proactive to the, the people that are going to listen to us. And there, there are a lot of people out there that would follow our advice if only they knew it. And I think we should capitalize on the, the strength of the pit bull. Um, 
It's, it's really surprising to me that we have this whole, you know, sort of media craziness because the pit bull has so many qualities which make it um, an exceptional animal around people. I mean, I, I would be the first to admit being a terrier and a big terrier, I mean, they can be a little tricky around other dogs. For years and years and years, they were known as the friendly dog. And, and the things that make them so good, um, and I think we should capitalize on these, and there's two things. One is their, their resilience or their bounce back time. The most resilience and the quickest bounce back time of any breed of dog, bar none. Um, the other thing is they are self-socializers. And basically all the breeds of dog fit into two categories. And there are those which will de-socialize as they grow up. And these are the normally standoffish dogs, all the shepherd dogs, you know, the good hundred breeds of shepherd dogs, all the Asian breeds of dog. And basically, they won't actively go up and say hello to someone. So that means tomorrow, they will even be less active about approaching people. Then we have the self-socializers, like all the retrievers, and the top of the pile is the pit bull. This socialization process is not static. The tendency to socialize can increase and decrease as each day goes on. So we have with a little pit bull these wonderful qualities. He's highly resilient. He has a tremendous bounce back time. He, he socializes like a drop in the bucket. So you ask, then why do we have bad pit bulls? Well, it's very difficult to produce one. And if you have a dog, a pit bull, that's not liking people, I mean, they, people have gone to extreme measures here. He's obviously a backyard dog. You know, if we now go back to your original question, why do we have this? There's always going to be a breed which people can call it the bad dog. And as soon as it becomes the bad dog, then people want to have it because it's a bad dog. Breed bands are, have two problems. They're under-inclusive, they fail to capture dangerous dogs that are not in the band category. And they're over-inclusive insofar as they capture thousands and thousands of dogs who are absolutely safe. Um, and so how on earth can that possibly be a sane solution to, to the problem of dog bites? In a meeting I was with the other day, they were very surprised to learn the Boston Terrier is also a bull breed. And, and they were thinking of banning the bull breeds. They said, oh, for God's sake, that's the state dog. We can't ban that. So you know, it's, it's crazy you know, to consider banning them. But what you do need to know is you need not to go to the ABC of Dogs book that you buy in the supermarket and read that all dogs are lovely and wonderful and fuzzy and they like to be cuddled and they're great with children. You just need to know the truth. And the truth of the matter is if you take this uh, you know, courageous animal, which is a pit bull, um, who you know, is, is really a, a, a good personality, typically not aggressive, certainly they can be absolutely wonderful dogs. The proviso is, you know, if they're properly bred and responsibly and properly owned, that they're not tortured and tormented like um, some unscrupulous people do. With a pit bull, uh, they have a naturally people-friendly temperament, and you have to do quite a bit of, uh, of quite 
thorough training to change that in a, in a well-bred pit bull, to make them suspicious. You know, if you think back to sort of, I think you look at sort of those old war stances, if they were like considered like the, the absolute uh, trustworthy, the ultimate kind of family pet that the kid could hang off, and that's sort of still true. It's just that, boy, boy, they fall into the wrong hands. But any breed can fall into the wrong hands. Um, yeah, the, the good that dogs do, you know, both in the family and, uh, you know, because they help people, therefore they're helping society, is uh, it definitely overwhelms uh, anything negative, uh, any small negatives that uh, might occur, despite what the anti-dog lobby might uh, say. But the fact is that's a very warped view, and they're not seeing, you know, the, the eight-ninths of the iceberg, which is all the good stuff, and the little tip is issues that occur, which are really, uh, relatively speaking, uh, small. So I think it has to be taken, uh, you know, in context. And, and also those odd dogs who do this behavior, again, right behind them is the irresponsible owner, because the dog is not going to be in a position to get into a, a pack or group, which is often the situation that leads to the lethal dog bite attacks. They're not going to be able to do that if they have somebody who actually cares for them, somebody where they have a home, where they have a, a yard that's fenced in, uh, where they're walked on leash. I mean, these things couldn't happen. So behind every lethal dog bite attack, there's an irresponsible owner. And if you say dogs that bite should not be bred, you're going to start to lose some of uh, you know the, America's favorite dogs. I mean, it's it's really much more to do with the person and the ownership than it is the dog. We have in a country where we no longer view dogs as dogs. Those of us who care about animals need to draw a line in the sand and say this is about dogs and their place in society. They give us far more than they take and they deserve all of them the same care, consideration and compassion. Our lives are enriched by all of them and when you throw one group of dogs that looks like this overboard, it's the beginning of the end of dogs as companion animals in America.